All right, I'd like to go ahead and get started. I know it's just a minute or two early, so if you guys are, you guys are good to go. Um, got a lot of content. Uh, how many of you were in my uh, earlier dev session, my awesome? Okay, I'm going to be covering some of the same concepts, but we're going to be using search. And so this is a session called Developer's Approach to Search Applications. How many of you were at SharePoint Evolu or SharePoint, the SharePoint conference last year here and saw my search session then? Awesome. This is totally different because that whole session, we solved search problems with full trust, right? Now we have more options, okay? We have more options, so we'll be talking about that. Uh, this is Dev 209. If you, uh, if you are willing to tweet and uh, say good things about the session, uh, SP Evo 13, Dev 209 would be the hashtag that you would use. I am not above bribing you. I said this same thing for my 207 session, and I got nothing. So I have three memory cards and I have three drink tickets for tonight. The first three people that come up here after my session and show me that you actually tweeted something nice, I'll give them to you. Uh, if you do have complaints or problems, then go ahead and use Dev 204. <laughs> All right, my name is Matt McDermott. I'm a SharePoint MVP. I've been that way for seven years. Um, I, I, I have a lot of pride in that because it is a community award and, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to be part of such a great community. I work for a company called Aptalon with four friends of mine. We're a consulting company. We do SharePoint stuff. And I live in Austin, Texas with my wife and my dog, Ruby. You'll see Ruby and dogs throughout my demos primarily because when you do demos for Microsoft and you use human faces, every human face you use, you have to have a model release. And so when you're doing social demos, you have hundreds of model releases to track down. I prefer to use dog faces. So uh, Ruby and I compete in a sport called agility. We take her all over the place and run. She's really, really good at it. And uh, I'm not so bad myself. I was a co-author on the experts book. I wrote a section on using the user profile service, which thankfully you don't have to read anymore because in 2013 it's all different. And that's what I covered in my last session. I also trained for Critical Path. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Matthew McD. My blog is ableblue.com slash blog and uh, uh, Matthew at Aptalon. I will be posting all of the content up, and at the end of the session, I'll have a bit.ly to get you to that blog post. So I want to talk to you about the new 2013 Search API. Primarily, I'm going to be focusing on the REST API, but the same tenets apply to any of your client-side um, any of your client-side technologies that you're going to be using for SharePoint 2013. We'll talk a little bit about creating custom search controls. I use the word custom very liberally because we now don't have to compile with the new search engine. Microsoft has made enormous investments in the way that we render search results, and it's, it's a wonderful thing because I don't have to deal with XSL anymore. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. We'll be talking about what you can do with no code. Well, you know, JavaScript code, client-side code, stuff you can write in Notepad, but no, no compiled code. And then we'll talk about query time logic, the kind of control that we've been asking for in our search solutions we now have. So the problem is, and this is your problem and mine, is describing to your clients, your customers, your business users that Microsoft just gave you the keys to the kingdom when it comes to search. And so now you have to learn how to use those keys to promote content, to make the search experience better, and there is so much there. We're going to cover just a little bit of that topic, but there is so much that you can do out of the box that we used to. Last year I showed you how to do it, we used to have to code for, and now we can do it straight out of the UI. I'm going to be spending the rest of the time talking about the REST interface to search and some of the cool things that you can do with the REST interface. And then, of course, since I'm kind of the social guy, um, we'll be doing people search so I can show you more photos of my dog. The toolbox available to you as developers is huge. I'm going to be skimming the surface on it, but I want to give you a couple of slides so that you sort of understand depending on the business problem that you have, that you have different tools available to you. Because quite often, you will have, you know, you, ha you know the developer where everything's a web part, right? I have a hammer, the whole world is a nail. So they've built these really complex applications using web parts, and you're like, uh, how come you didn't use this technology that's like out of the box and supported? So 
The search center is one of the primary resources that you have available to you. Back in 2010, the only way we could execute searches outside of the search center was to create our own test harness or download something from CodePlex. Now we can actually make RESTful calls directly into SharePoint and, and mimic the behavior that goes on in the search center. So we have that level of control. Then we can start looking at search applications, things that you can create, things that you can write to generate even more information for your users to be able to satisfy either their requests inside the search center or write client applications that leverage search. About an hour ago, I was talking to somebody who was talking about iterating through. He's written an application who, that he iterates through 100,000 user profiles. I said, what? He said, I iterate through 100,000 user profiles. It's a really cool application. I said, yeah, but how many servers do you have that are handling those requests? Because if you use search, you're not iterating through anything. You're saying, hey, here's a property. Go give me all the people that match that. And you'll get user profiles back. So there's a lot of ways that you can do that. And search applications will demonstrate that. I'll also show you a couple slides on content enrichment. This is something we've wanted in regular SharePoint for a long time. It's something that existed in FAST for SharePoint 2010. That's the ability during the index process to actually go out, make a call out to a service that you write to add more good stuff to the things that are being indexed. We now have that available to us in SharePoint 2013. And then finally, if you are going to need to connect to something that the out-of-the-box SharePoint search, um, search connections won't let you create a connection to, the preferred way to go after that data is to use the BCS. You write a BCS, um, you write a BCS connector, either for a web service, for SQL, or any database, actually, SQL, Oracle, whatever you have the drivers for, or you can write a custom .NET provider for BCS to go do whatever you want. So I use that process when I'm doing prototyping. I use that process because I've written a custom XML provider for BCS. So when my client says, we have this huge DB2 system, I say, that's great. Send me an Excel spreadsheet with like 10 lines. I convert that to XML, and I can build them a prototype overnight. And then we go in and build the real connector. But it allows me to do that rapid prototyping. So that's just one example. Another example of a custom BCS connector for search is when we have databases or data sources that would be prohibitively expensive to go after. I have a client that has an AS400 process that runs all of their billing. And once a night, it spits out an XML file that says that it worked. It has a list of all the problems. And they had a custom report that they wrote that would go against that XML file. And they said, should we change that? And I said, does it work? And they said, yes. I said, do you want to change it? Well, the COBOL guy died. And uh, his son doesn't want to learn COBOL. I said, then let's just use a BCS connection to that data source, and then let's render it. So every night that file gets replaced, about 10 minutes later, we crawl it with search, and we have a search application that they never imagined would take. It took us about five days to make all of that work. And it's super simple to troubleshoot, because I have my .NET guy, fresh out of college. He knows how to do this stuff. So it's a very interesting process. I'm going to talk about the search center. I'm going to talk about search applications. And I'll show you a little slide about that content enrichment stuff. So this is the SharePoint 2013 search architecture. Everything that is in green for the IT guys is considered a unit of scalability. So if your indexing is taking too long, add more indexers. If your crawling is taking too long, add more crawlers. The piece that's really cool here is that we have an API now that's running on our web front ends that allows us to make restful calls to search. So no longer do I have to make SOAP calls against the query Azimax. I make RESTful calls. And I can use any of my SharePoint client-side technologies to do that. On the back end there, the crawl part, that's where we would create our BCS custom connector. Let's say that you had a homegrown system that you had written your own flat file database. Then you would go ahead and write your own connector that SharePoint would use to crawl that data and surface it. The piece that's very cool is this content processing component. I'm going to dive into that. Content processing falls between crawl and index. 
The content processing pipeline has four steps. It parses the document, it looks for any registered content enrichment providers, then it does word breaking, and then it does this custom entity extraction. It's during the content, it's during the content enrichment phase that I can call out to a custom web service. I can say, I found that word, term, group of terms, dictionary, and you want me to go do something with it. And then the web service can return additional metadata. It can do all kinds of things, because you own that. That's what you write. Okay? So if you write that custom web service to do things, then that will go ahead and process that document at index time, or I'm sorry, not at index time, but immediately before it's indexed at processing time. So how many of you work with salespeople? How many of you are salespeople, first of all, because I'm going to make fun of them? Okay. How many of you work with them? How many of you have salespeople that actually put metadata on their documents when they put them into SharePoint? Right. And then they go home on Friday night after partying and they spend all night tagging friends on Facebook. They don't get that that's metadata too, right? Because they want their friends to find their stuff, but they won't tag their own documents. So you can use this content enrichment to solve that problem. Let's say that you had standard documents. You have standard Word documents, and you have them populate the name of the project, the, com the customer. Then you could crawl that content and have the enrichment service look for those tags and then populate the metadata on the document and fix it and then ultimately make it more findable because then it will get indexed. So that's one option you have as developers. In fact, um, my partner Maurice Prather is going to be doing a webinar on the whole content enrichment stuff um, next month. Um, and so that's going to be globally available both live and as a, uh, as a recording. So one of the things you have to get over as a, um, as a search developer, as opposed to a list and library developer, is that the names in search are based on managed metadata, I'm sorry, they're based on managed properties, search managed properties. So when the, when the indexer crawls that content in SharePoint, it extracts these new field names. Let's say that you created a new field name um, as a site column. It's going to crawl that. It's going to prepend it with OWS underscore, and that becomes a crawled property. You then have to manage that property, create a managed property of your own name. It could be the same name, but you can use your own name. So let's say that I created one called department. Well, that's pulling here from the people department property off of the user profile and OWS underscore department. So when I'm a search developer, I'm going to use the managed property name, not the field name. Now, in 2010, you had to create these all yourself, and it was only through the search service application. The good news is now in SharePoint 2013, first of all, if they're site columns, they're automatically generated, and there is a naming convention for those that includes a queue and a TXT and all kinds of other crud, but it's predictable. And you can create these at the site collection and even down to the site level. So if you have access to a site and you want to create a search application in that site, you now have all of the tools you need to create this. So managed properties, they're not just for administrators anymore. They are still configured at the farm level, but they can also be configured at the site collection level, in which case every subsite will inherit that setting. And then every site or web will also have its own settings where it can override or modify the ones coming down from the site collection. Now, managed properties have types, multi-value, string, integer, number. And then they also have properties associated with them. Query means that we can simply use them in a query. Search means that they can be used and in the, they're, uh, they're put into the index and used that way. Retrieve means I can call them back. So you may have social security number. You don't want that going out to the UI. At least in the United States, you don't. Passport number. You don't want that getting echoed out to the UI. But you may want to still index that. Refine means that it's available as a refiner. Sort means that we can sort them. Yes, you've been asking for sort for years and years and years in search. 
We can now create sortable properties in SharePoint. And then safe means it's available anonymously. So if you're building a UI for an anonymous facing public website and you want those search results to those metadata properties to pop out in search results, you have to mark them as safe, otherwise they will be trimmed out of the results. Now, if you're going to be constructing queries in SharePoint search, then you have query language options. The preferred approach is KQL, the keyword query language. It is the default query language in SharePoint 2013. You can also still use FQL. So the fast query language is part of the fast for SharePoint and fast ESP family of products. It's still available, but it's, default, it's uh, disabled by default. But there's just, you just flip a switch and you turn it on and, and, um, um, with a little bit of PowerShell, and, K and uh, FQL is available to you. So if you've written applications that use FQL for SharePoint 2010, they'll still work in 2013. You just need to turn the option on. Sadly, if you have written, um, if you've written web parts and queries that use the SQL query language, that has been removed from the product. So these, this will not work anymore. KQL is your best bet. So some examples of KQL. That's pretty easy. Free text. You put it in, put it in between some quotes, and it comes out. It's going to go find everything that has SharePoint on it. But I can also use wildcards. So I can do share star, and it will find both my share points and my share pints. Okay? And I can also do properties. So author MCD star is going to find everything where the author has MCD as a, as a prefix. And I can also do specific property requests. In this case, I'm looking for content type image. That's going to return everything in SharePoint that's been returned as a content type of image. These are cool operators. I'll show you this one. Near. If I say SharePoint near social, the default is 8. If it's within eight words of SharePoint, I'm sorry, if SharePoint is within eight words of social, any direction, it's going to find it. I can also throw near with some parens and a, and a distance, and it will, it will pull that down. So if I want specifically SharePoint search, what I should do is do quote SharePoint search. But if I want it within about three or four words, I can do that as well. O near says the first word first, the second word second, and on. Okay, so it's not going to find social SharePoint, it's only going to find SharePoint social. Okay, so you have some API options, you have the REST and the CSOM, but search Azimax has been deprecated. It's still there. Okay, you can still, if you've written an app against 2010 that works against search Azimax, you can still use it, but there's no guarantee that it's going to be supported, there's no guarantee that it's going to be present going forward. So I would start start new and start working with REST or the, or the client-side object model. So let's just talk a little bit about searching for stuff inside of SharePoint. So if I go into the SharePoint Search Center, one of the things you'll notice right away is, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking about. OK, this is better. So these are pre-query suggestions. I'm going to talk about those a bit later, but it's basically these are successful searches that other people have executed in the search center. The analytics system picks up on that, stack ranks them, and shows them in a certain way. Then I can execute my search. So this is a simple keyword query for SharePoint. Like I said before, if I want to, I can do share star, and that will also find things with SharePoint on them. Now, I use the search center to do my testing. OK, because then I can just take this query string, like share star, and I can jump out to, I'm going to cheat a little and just grab a, let's grab this guy right here. I can go into my, let's take a few of these off. There we go, content type image. OK, so this is a query that essentially says to the REST API, underscore API. If you were in the previous session, we talked about the fact that underscore API replaces underscore VTI, underscore bin, client service. You know, so we've, we've gained about 12 characters, depending on who you were calling. 
And then I pass in to the query rest endpoint query text. That is whatever you would have typed into the search box. You put it there, you're going to get the same results. And I'll show you that by grabbing this Java content type image. Okay, and I'm going to jump back over here and paste it in. And so this is a, um, this is a, <laughs> this is a failed query right there. Doesn't like that, so let's do this. This is the one I was looking for. Um, so what I'm trying to do is grab that single image. I said I would do some um, a, a grandiose shows of my dog's faces. The, um, the search here for Java, if I take that, you'll notice that I have a lot of different content types. I can go back here. I can swap out this, um, this guy, delete. There's my query. So there's a RESTful query. It returns XML by default. If you want to use REST, then when you construct your REST query, you simply pass in the request for accepts JSON, and it will return JSON to you. But for testing, you can simply execute the queries directly into the, uh, into the browser and make changes. Then what you can do is look at some of the results that you get back. And so down here, I'm noticing that I have the document ID. I have the work ID. Here's the title, Java Dog. Um, here's the author. And here is the path to that, um, to that display item that returned it. So you have all of this data available to you. There's a number of other things I can do in the search center. I can do property queries like author, colon. And that'll bring back all of the documents, anything that was authored by her. And just like using a refinement, I can say is document. And it'll bring back just the documents. So, Simple queries inside the search center. Um, take whatever's in that search box, drop it into a REST query, and you will get the same, should get the same results. Now, there will be slight variations, and I'll discuss that in just a sec, but this would be basically the same query returning back the results for wonders.pptx, and here is wonders.pptx, okay? So fairly straightforward to be able to execute those searches. Now, the SharePoint search engine is very smart. It has two very cool social people features. One of them is called um, nickname matching, and the other is called phonetic name search. Okay? They solve two different problems. In the United States, if your name is Bill, you were probably born William. Okay? If your name is Jack, you were probably born John. So there are some standard nicknames that are used throughout the world. So the search engine has multilingual nicknames built into it so that if you're searching from a multilingual UI, in my case I have an English search center, it's going to use that nickname matching to help me out. So here I go. I'm going to type in Bill, and it's going to expand that search. Oh, here's another very cool feature that only pops up every once in a while, so I'm going to draw your attention to it. I clicked on Bill before. This is a personal query suggestion. So if you typed this in and it was your first Bill search, you don't see this. This is me. And it will actually say, you know, you found this before, and I want to change the, I want to go into the language file and have it say dot, 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 dummy. But, uh, but that would be mean. Um, so anyway, here's Bill. I'm not looking for that. So it's showing me Bill, an exact hit, but Willa is a near hit because Willa is close to William. Will is, a, is an acceptable replacement for Bill in the United States. Here's also William Perry and Ryan Williams. So that's phonetic name matching. It works in many, many languages. Um, and I'm sorry, that's nickname matching. It works in many, many languages. The other one is phonetic name matching. So if I, I met somebody named Renee Lowe, if I type in Lowe looking for Renee, I get her hit, Renee Lowe. But I also get Spencer Lowe, a completely different spelling. And it does this phonetically as well. Okay, so it, you have these options that you can decorate your people queries with to be able to get more information out. Now, Ralph is in there because he happens to be a dachshund and he's low to the ground. So I actually got a hit there on his profile. But, um, but the phonetic name matching works really well. So when you're working with REST, 
There's other things that you can do to enhance your query. The best one, and I'll show you this when we get to the, the app at the end, is the source ID. That GUID references a result source inside of SharePoint. That particular GUID says, I want a people search. Okay, we used to reference scopes. Now we reference result types. So that GUID specifies a specific result source. You can also decorate your query with select properties. I highly recommend that. That way you only bring back across the wire those properties that you intend to use in your application. Enable nicknames, phonetic, enable phonetic simply allows you to create a query that would mimic whatever they would find in the search center. Okay, that would mimic what they find in the search center. The other thing you can add is client type. If you were over on the IT Pro side, you'd learn that we can now throttle requests from different clients so that we can kind of prioritize traffic in and out of our app. If you don't use the client type, then you might get throttled right out of your farm. You might be able to work with your IT folks to use the client type with a specified string that they give you so that they would know what requests are coming in from that approved application. So our 2013 search results are a lot of fun. It starts with a query. Then what happens is query rules are run against it before it gets sent to the index. The index is, um, is we ping the index, we get results back from the index. Based on the results that we get back from the index, result types are applied. So there's a set of rules that establish the result types. Result types are kind of like scopes in SharePoint 2010, but you have a ton more control. The result type also defines what the display template looks like. Instead of having one big, huge block of XML to deal with now, I get each item in my results inspected, and I can decide what each item in my result looks like. And then we get our display. All of this happens in hundreds of seconds. It's truly amazing how fast all of this stuff works for the end user. If you're also using the SharePoint 2013 UI with the, um, on the internet side in the search center, we also take advantage of MDS. So you have minimum download strategy. If you refresh your page, if you refresh your search, it's just going to refresh that core part. It's not going to go back and refresh all the Chrome. So there's a lot of optimization built into this system. And so let me show you how we can do some things to improve the search center without having to deploy any code. Were you guys hoping that I'd compile? I will later, I promise. So just if you're hoping for a compilation, just stick around. It'll happen. OK, so what I have here on a people search, I want, I've added to my user profiles. OK, I've added to my user profiles. I've added a property that is the, um, that is the user's uh, Twitter handle. There it goes. And so right here, I simply added a, uh, a Twitter account name. This particular account, Willis, is using mine. So what I want to do is I want to display that in my search results and then let people click on it and be sent to, the, um, be sent to that result, um, that result source. So let me see here real quick. Let me make sure that I have my... I'm going to cheat just a little bit so that you can see how this works. You don't need to see all, there's, there's a lot of just behind the scenes stuff that's very easy. But essentially what I did here is I opened up the design manager. Okay, I opened up the design manager. So if I'm in the search center, display templates run at the search center at the site collection level. So I'm going to go into the design manager. And I'm going to go to Upload Design Files, and I'm going to click this link. This takes me to the master page library for my search center. I'm going to open Display Templates. I'm going to go into Search. And in here are all of the out-of-the-box display templates. All I did was go down and find the item person uh, um, display template, drag that and drop it onto my page, drop it onto my desktop. So grab item person here. And then I went ahead and grabbed the item, 
person. Actually, we'll just stick with item person this time. Then I open this up and edit it. Okay, the first thing you want to do is change the title. So I changed the title to Twitter people item. So I just went in here and changed that to Twitter people item. Then what I want to do is I have to incorporate, I have to incorporate my managed properties into this. How many of you did that in 2010 core search results web part? It was awful, right? It's a whole separate field, XML, miserable. Check out how easy this is. Manage property mapping is right here. If I go to the end, I simply have my managed property. My managed property name is right there at the end. Now that I have the managed property name in there, SharePoint knows construct a query that's going to include and return that managed property to me. And then what I do is I go down into my UI. I go down into my UI and I use, you'll notice that they're using these special tokens. Can you guys at the back see that okay? You're using this special token. So this comment with the hash, hashtag underscore and then it ends with underscore hashtag, that comment is where I can put some JavaScript. So I put some JavaScript in and basically I'm just looking to see if the context of the current item, which has my field on it now, is empty. And if it is not empty, then I go ahead and create a div. I put the Twitter ID literal out there. And then I construct an A tag to twitter.com. And look, here's that replacement again. So there's the beginning of the replacement tag. Here's the end. That allows me to do a little bit of inline JavaScript, if you will. And then it's context, current item, Twitter account name. Now I have to give them something to click on. So let's go out here and let's do exactly the same thing. So if this works, what I should see is Twitter ID with that link. There's all kinds of mischief you can get up to now because all this JavaScript is running for you on behalf of the user. So here we go. How do we get that into SharePoint? Well, we're going to take that item Twitter person. I'm hoping that's the one I clicked on. That's the backup. Let's make sure this is the right one here. Yep, looks like it's all there. OK, I'm happy about that. Make sure. There it is. All looks good. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load that into SharePoint. And I can do that really simply. I can open up that search um, display templates location. I can grab item Twitter person. I can drag it and drop it in here. And what SharePoint's going to do is upload it. It's down here at the bottom. And then I'm going to do an F5 just to refresh the screen. And you'll notice that it created a matching JS file. You do not mess with the JS file. Because it's not really JavaScript. It's kind of Microsoft's own version that they're munging together. That's what actually gets processed. You continue to edit the HTML file. You can open it right out of here in, um, in the search results, and you're good to go. So that's the display template uploaded. Now what we need to do is tell search to use it. So I'm going to go back into site settings, and I'm going to create a result type. Looks like I already have one from my previous demo, so let me delete that. And here's my result type. I'm going to copy the person result type. And I'm going to go down here. And the only thing I'm going to change is what gets shown. Instead of showing a people item, I want to show a Twitter people item. You'll notice that it changed. It changed to that Twitter person JS file. I can choose save here, bless you. I can choose save here, go back to the search center, search for SharePoint. And if it works, I should jump over to people. And right here is Ruby's Twitter ID, Golden Dog Ruby, Twitter ID, Matthew McD. OK? How easy is that? How long did that take in XSL? Right? That was ugly. Do you understand what I mean by I'm working on one item at a time? Because that whole JS file is being executed for that result. Then it gets executed for that result. Okay? It's not a big hash of 100 lines of results that I have to decide what they are. 
So then, of course, I can click on it and take you to um, Ruby's Twitter page if my internet connection is working, and it is. So there's Ruby's Twitter page. Uh, yes, you can follow my dog if you want. That would be fine. Um, so that's kind of cool. Very easy, very cool way to get, get your search results and get them working better. Now, what if I want to guide my users to better content? We used to use, we used to use um, best bets. Best bets were awful. They were so limited in what you can do. Now you can use query rules to take what somebody's doing and really help them find things. Let me show you two ways that I like to do that. I'm going to go in. I'm going to create a query rule because my salespeople are constantly losing their documents. So I'm going to go to all sources here. I'm going to choose a new query rule. Let's see. Let's run this against SharePoint content, local SharePoint results. So when, it, when, a, when someone runs a query against local SharePoint results, I'm going to call this your documents. Last year, we did this with custom code. This year, I don't need a condition. I just want it to run. This year, I'm going to add a result block. Okay, so here's my results for the subject term. That doesn't make any sense at all. So let's call this your documents. And I need to configure the query. Wow, if only there was a tool that would help me. Do you guys remember going into the XSL editor in the core search results web part, and it brought up a dialog that had nothing to do with editing or anything? It was just a text box? Well, I have a gift for you. It's this query builder. This is an actual search query builder. You'll notice that it actually already ran a search for me over there. But what I want to do is take whatever the search is and then go out and say the author equals the person who actually ran the query. Because we know that's who our people are looking, that's what our people are looking for. I can test that query. Oh, it tested. Okay, then I got I have sites in here. That's ugly. So what I really want is uh, property, yeah, it's not there. I want the property is document. It's in here somewhere. It's down in the ISs. There we go. Property is document equals a manual value. We'll just set that guy equal to one. And we'll add that. So I'm going to test my query. Oop, look, no sites. I'll choose OK. Now there's one other thing I want to do. You have the option. Maybe this is not what your people are looking for. So this may not be relevant to them at all. By default, this block is ranked within the core results, which means it may not show on the first page because it'll float around. And if there's more relevant stuff above it, your result block won't be there bugging them. But in my case, I want to slam it right into their face. So I'm going to say, always shown above the core results. Choose OK. Choose Save. And then I'm going to do one more, just for grins. New query rule. The rule name is going to be SharePoint people. Because if, share, if I do a search for um, SharePoint, it's going to find profiles that have stuff all over them, right? Anywhere that they say they're a SharePoint person. I want to make sure it's just their skill. So I'm going to look in this case, it has SharePoint people, where the query exact keyword exactly matches. Let's just use SharePoint. Actually, let's make this a best bet. Query, query contains one or more of these phrases. SharePoint, WSS, SPS, and ooh, Moss. OK. Now, I'm going to make sure that that entire query matches. And um, we're going to assign the entire query subject terms. And I think all of that looks good. So now what I'm going to do is add a promoted result. And add a remo result blocks look prettier. So here are, this is the SharePoint team. Configure the query. Hmm. How about, how about run this against local people? And let's make sure that we do, I'm going to get rid of the original term, because I'm going to force this right down their throat. Select the property, show all managed properties. 
select the property. I'm looking for skill. I need to call it A skill. It'll show up a lot higher in the list. Come on. Skills contains manual value SharePoint. Now you could obviously do this where you passed in the actual value. So there's my people. I'm going to choose OK. I want to show four. I'm going to choose OK. All that's good. I'm going to choose save. And let's go back to the search center. So I've added two special handlers. I'm going to search for SharePoint. And I get back your documents. So this is authored by Willa, contained SharePoint, right at the top there. And it hasn't processed my, uh, my people results yet here. Control, let's do an F5. F5. Oh. That's, this is the regular people result. That's not the one I was looking for. I think what happened is I, uh, I missed the don't float it. So let me just check real quick. Oh, did I do semicolons instead? Thank you. OK, let's check that. SharePoint people. Uh, semicolon separated. Thank you very much. Actually, you get the first drink ticket. Just got to come up. That's the one. Save that. And that looks good. And we'll go back to our search center. And there are our SharePoint team. Oh, you know, I don't like them that way. OK, let's look at the power of display templates here. This, uh, site settings, because that looks OK, but it's kind of big. Query rules, all sources, grab my SharePoint people. Drop down here, edit the result block, change the setting. Instead of using the default people item, let's force it to use the person intent item. I have no idea why it's person intent, but I know that it gives me a much better result in the search center because it puts them sideways. So there's my SharePoint team. Who helped me out there? OK, drink ticket and, uh, and memory stick for sure. So kind of cool. Now we've got promoted results. We've got our, got our information in there. So what else can we do? Well, right in the search center, we have this new refiners structure. How many of you worked with refiners in SharePoint 2010? That was fun, huh? That was fun. OK, so these result types down the side here are refiners. Let me give you a, an idea of how else we can use these. If I go into my search center here and I search for a customer, OK, I can add refiners right down the side here. And I can create, um, I can create display templates that actually call out to the internet. So in this case, this display template is using a Bing Maps integration because Bing has a REST interface. So I can decorate the rest. I can decorate the rest request for an image with a Bing Maps address and show that. But if you look down the side, I've also got refiners. So let's say that I want to find all of the silver partners that have um, more than fifty thousand in year-to-date sales. So you can create reports. You can create like a little BI center right in your search results, and these refiners, these graphical refiners, are out of the box. Well, if you, go into your, if you go into your display templates, you'll see there's one called filters. OK, there's one called filters. Filters are your refiners. So you're using the same technology to create your refiners as you are to create your display templates. So now we're using JavaScript and jQuery and all kinds of fun stuff to do that. So you can go out to the internet, and you can search on all kinds of refiners, and you will find two. What I want to show you is how to add these. So all I did was take this wonderful, wonderful gentleman's code, which I will post in my link later on, and show you this kind of cool refiner. I'm going to edit the refinement web part. OK, I'm going to edit the refinement web part. And before, you had to, you had to munge together an XML block. Now you do choose refiners, and I have a refiner designer. Okay. I don't know why they didn't call it the refiner designer, because it makes people laugh. It makes me happy to say that. So you choose the refinement properties that you want to use, 
And remember, when you create a managed property, you choose whether or not it's refinable. Once you have the, uh, the refinements working, you can go down and find things, like in this case, I'll choose city, and I'll add that, and I'm going to move it all the way to the top so that we can see it. And then down here, I'm going to say distribution. I'm going to spell it wrong, by city. And I'm going to choose that chart refinement item. Then I'm going to remember to scroll down and choose OK. And I'll check this in, choose continue. And so now what we can do is we can run a search. And I know that I just missed, I know I missed an OK box. It happens every time I do this demo. There's like three different OK boxes you have to choose. And so what I did is I closed the page. So let me edit the page, do this again real quick. Refinement web part, edit web part. Hit the refiner box, and I'll show you the button I missed. Here's city. Add it. Move it to the top. Go down here. City. Change this to chart item. This uses a, a jQuery charting component. And so the one I missed is I chose save up here. You have to save the web part. Choose OK. All right, now we got our chart. Choose save. We're good to go. So when I do a search for, uh, for pets, I get all my, oh, come on back. Really? It's being shy. You guys did see it, though, right? I know that I've got video evidence. There it is. So now I've got a chart refiner that's based on the values that are coming back from the, um, from the search results. Kind of cool? OK, kind of cool. Again. Honestly, I did not write the code, so you can go crazy for the next thing. I wrote all that code. I borrowed this from a blog post that I will give full credit to when I, uh, when I post everything up here. But I think creating the refiners is really where we're headed, right? Doing really cool graphical stuff using all kinds of different jQuery and JavaScript libraries because as long as we can run it client side, we can build refiners. So you have other search options. We, I've been showing you query this whole time. That's API search query. What if you have an enormous query that you need to do? Well, you have a URL limit. If that's the case, then use post query. If you use post query, then you construct the query body. So it can, the UR, if you run into URI re, uh, restrictions, then you can use this post query method instead and send a ton more data in. Okay? The other one is suggest. Suggest is very cool because this means that I can give an equivalent search experience to being inside SharePoint to my app outside of SharePoint. If, uh, if you forgot, let me show you real quick where we see query suggestions. I'm going to go back in here to my uh, customer search page here. Actually, let's go over here to everything. And if I type in SharePoint, I start seeing foundation, search, SharePoint search rocks, 2007-2010. Those are query suggestions. Well, it turns out that I have a REST API now that I can use to get those query suggestions. So if I'm writing a Windows 8 app, Windows, when I, or Windows 8, when I execute the charms bar, will ask all of the applications, hey, who's registered for suggestions? So I can register an entry point with my app and say, I am. And that's what I've done here. So the on search pane suggestions requested method is going to run. When I run that, I'm going to do a little bit of work at the start. And then I'm going to jump into code that should look familiar to you. You guys OK in the back with the size of that? Is that a yes? Yeah, OK. So what I have here is I'm going to call the my site host underscore API search suggest. I'm going to pass in the query text. This is defined by the Windows 8 API. Windows 8 is going to pass in a, uh, a search term to me. But there's other things I can do, like I can follow best practices. The best practices from, um, from Microsoft is don't do more than five. You could pass in 20, but it's going to blow your UI out. So just pass in four or five. So I do uh, number I, number of query suggestions, four. And then I turn off the hit highlighting. 
If you don't turn off the hit highlighting, you're going to get back a B and B that's supposed to be bolded in the UI, and it's going to all show up as plain text here. Okay? So I turn that stuff off. And then what I do is I go to, to this, uh, this method, get, su get suggestions async. And in get suggestions async, I simply go through and I create a, a method called get XML from rest async. And then I call an asynchronous method. When that comes back, I just rip through it and I turn every result, which comes back as a cell, I turn every result into a suggestion. And so that append query suggestions is the list of suggestions that gets sent back to the, back to the Windows 8 app. So if I run this guy, and I am not a Windows 8 developer, okay? So you guys saw this from the search, from the, the social section, right? You guys saw that part. I'm going to do a charms F for find, and I'm going to click down here on my app so that it's sending, it just told my app, hey, if you've got a search page, let me see it. That's this. That's my search results page in my app. But it's also registered to listen for query suggestions. So I'm going to start typing SharePoint. And wait for it. Those are the ones that I've typed before. There's a little timing thing that if any of you are Windows 8 app developers, I would love to hear from you. But it's, uh, oh, come on. It's being shy. Here we go. Come on, you can do it. There it goes. So these are coming out of SharePoint. So there's something about clicking around that I just, I'm just missing the timing on it. I'll fix that, I promise. But I thought that was kind of cool. And I'm not above begging for just a little bit of a so I think that's kind of cool. I'm getting my results out of SharePoint. But of course, the next thing you want to see is if I do that search, that I actually get my search results out of SharePoint, and I can generate some folks inside my, uh, inside my, SharePoint, inside my SharePoint search and social app. So this is the same results that I would have gotten if I had executed a people search result. And uh, just to let you know, if I do Bill again, because you guys saw the results for Bill, I have it decorated with phonetic search results and nickname matching true. So let me show you that. I really thought that was going to get a round of applause. But it's OK. I understand. I guess drink tickets just isn't enough for you people. OK, so let me, uh, let me stop debugging here. Come on, let's go. Get out of the way, get out of the way. Get out of full screen. Stop debugging. And let me show you that search, res that search query here for, um, so the people search, so the suggestions, I'm just saying, hey, SharePoint, send me back some suggestions from the, su the REST suggestion service. For the people search, when you actually execute the search, you, uh, you register an on query submitted handler, and then your Windows 7 app will do that. I execute a, an asynchronous query um, for my users. So again, here's my my site, sorry, here's my my site, here's my query, that's the query endpoint, and then I run, here we go, this is all the good stuff we learned today. Selected properties, I'm just pulling down the properties that I need to see. So that's this first part. The next part is the source ID. This particular GUID is the source ID for the people search results. If you want to just pull back documents, there's a result type for that. If you want to just pull back your custom customer's result type, create a result type for that. Find out what the GUID is. You've got to talk to your IT pros about this. Because you used to just do scope, and it was whatever was in the UI. Now it's a little bit more complicated, but I don't think it's horrible. And then once you have that source, then you can decorate it with um, enable nicknames, true, because I want people search to act like people search. So I do enable nicknames is true, and I do enable phonetic is true. And that gives me the exact same results in my search center that I'm getting out of. And this was a pain in 2010. I mean, there was all kinds of fun stuff you had to do to get this level of result. So um, once you've got that, then we're just going to do the same thing as before. I'm cheating and using an XML reader. I could have easily made this a full-blown REST request and added uh, a JSON request to it, which is the preferred way to go. Um, then once I have those results, I simply take the results. I look for, wow, those, those, those are driving me crazy. I look for preferred name. That gives me the preferred name. Uh, I do the picture URL, the job title, the about me, and the path. That way, when I go into my app, if I have the path, the path is where their my site is. 
So I'm going to go charms F. I'm going to drop down and grab my, grab my search, my SharePoint search. Uh, let's do, just for consistency, let's do SharePoint again. I'm going to do execute that search. Come on. There it goes. I'm going to execute that search, and now that I have the path, I can do silly things like click on the result and take you to your my site. Okay, so there's all kinds of stuff you can do. It's not a big deal. It's Windows 8. The hardest part for me was just learning this whole Metro UI design, and, or not the UI design, but just learning how to, how to get into my samples and how to get back to my app. That was hard. I'm telling you, you think this is funny, but just trying to figure out how I can efficiently um, demo this to you like I know what I'm doing is, is kind of complicated. Anyway, I'm just joking. All right. So there are some final considerations for all this. Payload optimization. I was not optimizing this payload. If you saw the social stuff, you know that I know how to do JSON. In this case, I'm just using XML. You want to use JSON. It's about 10% smaller than XML. And what you do is you create a header that is accept application JSON, OData verbose, and you're off to the races. You can do that. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about and you want, to do the social, you want to do the search stuff, check out my social code and just swap out the, swap out the URLs for the search stuff. Use query modifiers. If you use bypass result types, it'll trim down what it's sending back to you because it won't tell you what result type. If you know you're querying for people, you don't need result types. You're getting people back. Okay. Um, select properties. This is an optimization. Just like in SQL, you don't want to do select star against, our, against the search engine. You want to optimize the properties that you bring back. You can also, if you want a paging, experience for people, you can give a row limit of say 10 or 20 and then you can do start row of 1 or 0 and that will bring back the first page and then you do rows per page and you can make every time they move you can request the next group of search results. So you can create your own optimization and paging far easier than we ever could in 2010. And then finally um, on the, uh, on the request, you can accept gzip deflate. That will help you with your, um, with your compression and make the payload even smaller. So there's a lot that you can do uh, as a developer to make this stuff go really fast. And uh, the develop from a developer tools perspective, um, IE dev tools is your friend. Um, when I was debugging that chart refiner, um, <laughs> when I was debugging the chart refiner, I'm dragging jQuery files around trying to find them. Open up Profiler, look for your 404s. It'll tell you exactly what file it's missing and makes it go very quickly to get you to the point where you can debug these things. Um, here are some bit.ly's to get you to uh, MSDN resources. Uh, the SharePoint queries that I was doing are up there at the top. The SharePoint search REST uh, interface is there. Creating search connectors with demo files is there. And then there's a whole thing on content enrichment that's also available to you. Um, like I said, I will make this deck available. Here's a bit.ly to the blog post that I'm constructing, MCD, SPEVO, 13, that'll get you to my content. And like I said, if you, uh, if you like the content, please go ahead and hit me on Twitter. Let me know. If you have questions, if you've got to dash off, ask me on Twitter. I'll answer. Um, and you have my email address from the beginning. Thank you guys so much for coming out to this conference. I love coming here.